to the summer edition of The Coffee House, where in the next hour, learn what some local communities are doing about global warming. We've got the African sounds of Anunsagroma. Liz Lerman looks in on an innovative program to teach teens about dance and themselves. Also, household pests. Which ones are dangerous? Which ones merely annoying? Our Ed Bajor spars a few rounds with a bantamweight boxing contender and learns the hard way. Lisa Foster pulls no punches. Plus, summer viewing tips in the movie theater and on the tube from Pat Alterheide, Tacoma Park's Independence Day Parade, and a poem by Rebecca Villarreal. Hi, and welcome to the Coffee House. If you think the weather has been hotter than usual, you're right. But not just this year. The 10 hottest years of the century have been in the last 15 years. Most scientists think humans are the cause. We burn up huge quantities of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Some of these emissions collect in the atmosphere. There, they trap the sun's heat, warming the Earth's surface, increasing extreme weather conditions, and killing off species. Leading scientists predict by the year 2100, the Earth's temperature could rise by as much as 7.2 degrees and the sea level by 39 inches. Global catastrophe is a definite possibility, but the experts say it's not inevitable. Meaningful action at the international level has been slow, but a number of local communities have seized the initiative. Tacoma Park and Mount Rainier, Maryland, for example, are jointly developing an action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings and transportation and in waste management. Sure. Government officials and citizens from both cities met in early June to brainstorm and come up with a program. Partly it's a question of what local governments can do to reduce their own emissions. Partly it's a question of what they can do to assist, encourage, or require individuals and businesses to do their part. The good news is you can do good and well by being energy efficient. So argues Michael Totten, Tacoma resident and co-director of the Institute for Environment and Business at the World Resources Institute. Also joining us is Fred Sassine, an energy specialist with the Congressional Research Service and as mayor of Mount Rainier, a leader in the citizens, sorry, Cities for Climate Protection campaign. Welcome both of you to the Coffee House. Thanks very much, Mark. Yep. Good to be here, Mike. Um, Fred, uh, we just saw some footage of that public meeting that was co-sponsored by your city, Mount Rainier, and Tacoma Park to come up with some kind of action plan. Uh, tell us a little bit about what steps local communities like yours are taking. Well, let me set the framework a little bit. There are four areas uh, in which you can target actions to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Probably the single most important one is energy use. And the simplest terms, uh, the ways to improve that are to do more with energy efficiency, substitute renewable energy, or perhaps use natural gas to back out uh, some higher carbon emitting fuel. So the first area is energy, probably the most important one. Carbon fixation is another area, and basically that involves planting more trees or uh, reclaiming green space from asphalt areas and so forth because plants fix carbon and take it out of the atmosphere. Uh, two other areas that are important but probably less directly accessible, especially to small towns, include uh, methane, which a lot of our landfills are emitting methane now, and there are ways to capture that and use that as a productive this fuel. This is from decomposition. Exactly. Uh, but that's more a province of county governments than small towns. Uh, and the other one is uh, chlorofluorocarbons and their associated uh, products. Um, yeah, I thought CFCs were banned. Uh, the production is, but uh, some still exist, and what they're being replaced with are other forms that are lower emitting, but still not necessarily yet zero. Uh, but there, this is also an area where there's probably very little that small towns can do with that. But I did want to mention those because methane and the CFCs are very much more intense in terms of their effect uh, pound for pound on climate change. But much change. less present. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, energy forms I mentioned, uh, they really address the CO2 problem more directly and are much more uh, readily accessible to action by cities. So, Speaking of which. Um, Basically, it's a bootstrap operation, especially for a small town with limited staff and not a lot of resources. But I want to emphasize to your viewers that uh, it is, while it is challenging, 
it's really a lot of fun here. I mean, think of uh, when you were a kid and you went on a treasure hunt. This is kind of what that's like. There are savings to be had and there are economic benefits from that. Uh, it, we just have to change the way we look at and think about operations within small towns and small city governments in order to ferret them out and take advantage of the uh, savings. The uh, four key areas I want to emphasize in this are learning, activation, leading by example, and partnerships. And in terms of the learning dimension, uh, first thing we need to think about is the economic motives. There's a direct economic motive because, uh, in particular with energy efficiency, because it generates cost savings. So this, uh, for example, Mount Rainier was a very important way uh, I sold this idea to my city council because they're always concerned about ways to cut costs. Uh, the other dimension, the environmental dimension, is critically important, as you well know, but it's often uh, very difficult to quantify what the economic values are by preserving the environment. There is definitely an economic value, but it's always difficult to know how to put a dollar value to it. Externalities. Yes, but at the local level, the way to think about it is enhanced quality of the community. And that's very, uh, again, a very tangible thing, especially for city council members and for residents in small cities and small towns. Uh, another thing that leaders in small governments can do is find volunteer experts within their community. Tacoma, for example, benefits from having a lot of uh, federal employees who know a lot about energy efficiency uh, and like uh, activities that can be used to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Another action that small cities can take is to get training for their staff to expose them to this kind of specialized area of energy efficiency, renewable energy, and how that can apply to activities within the city government. Usually uh, the Public Works Department is the one that would be most directly concerned with energy use because they're involved with uh, maintenance and operations Public of buildings facilities. and so forth, which involve energy use, but it's usually a small piece of the whole picture that they're thinking about. Let's come back to that in a, in a little bit uh, and talk more about what governments, as governments, can do to cut greenhouse gas emissions. But I also want to talk a little bit about what individuals and businesses can do. And uh, we have a report uh, by Ross Adams. Uh, let's take a look at what one individual Tacoma homeowner is doing. Okay. On the outside, this Tacoma Park house looks like any other, but on the inside, it's chock full of environmentally friendly technologies. Albert Nunez, a consultant on energy efficiency, owns the house. He says one simple way to save energy is to use compact fluorescent lights. These are use about a quarter of the energy of a conventional incandescent, and therefore they save a significant amount of money, depending on how much you pay for electricity, over the life of the lamp, over the 10,000 hour life of the lamp. Nunez says a wise consumer will look at more than the sticker price. A conventional light bulb may only cost um, uh, 50 cents to a dollar, but it'll only last 750 hours. Uh, a comparable compact fluorescent lamp, on the other hand, uh, may cost anywhere from nine to $20, but it'll last 10,000 hours. During the winter months, Nunez says home radiators like this one can waste up to a third of their heat if the adjacent wall is not insulated. But there's a simple solution. This is a piece of double foil faced insulating board. You just simply slide it in behind the radiator to keep the heat from escaping out the exterior wall reflecting the heat back into the space. This may be your worst energy waster. Nunez says many consumers don't realize it, but they're throwing good money out the window. What to do? Nunez suggests double pane or replacement windows, heat blocking sunscreen, or something called window quilts. You can see that it has a top uh, seal roller at the top. The window quilt has been on the market for more than 15 years. Nunez says it is a great way to secure your windows in winter or summer. They seal the window completely when they're in the down position so that you not only stop uh, the heat loss from conduction and 
uh, radiation coming through, but also you greatly reduce the amount of air that's moving through that opening. Not all energy savings require newfangled technologies. This tree here on the southwest corner of the house, this deciduous tree, is shading the house, the back side of the house, in the late afternoon. And in the winter months, it loses its leaves, allowing passive solar gain to go directly into the house. Trees and environmentally friendly technologies may only add up to small energy savings for individual homes. But Nunez says in the aggregate, they can actually affect the very temperature of our planet. For The Coffee House, I'm Ross Adams. Michael Totten, you're sitting here with a uh, compact, compact fluorescent of a newer vintage. Uh, why don't you tell us about it? This is called a subcompact. I also call it a climate-friendly bank account uh, because, as Albert mentioned, these are much more efficient. They last 10 times longer, use 75% electricity, give the same quality of light. But the interesting thing is if you buy six of these, which you now can purchase right off the Internet, it'll cost you about $40. Uh, if you have that in the bank account, uh, that over the life of this bulb, your bank account will earn you $60. If you take that money and put it into the stock market, uh, on average return, you might make about $120. Over the life of this uh, six pack of bulbs, you'll make about $270. So your best investment is literally in this little bank account right here. I've got a couple dozen of these in my house, uh, pays a vacation in the Caribbean for me every other year. So you can have a climate friendly investment that yields great co-benefits like the mayor just mentioned. Um, we found that there are so many opportunities like this at my organization that it led us to commit ourselves to a pledge of achieving zero net carbon emissions or better over the next 70 months or sooner. This what is, does that mean? This is an extraordinary pledge that we think we're the first organization in the, the world. Um, in comparison, the recent Kyoto Protocol calling for reduction of greenhouse gases worldwide suggested about a 5 to 7 percent reduction. Scientists are saying that to stabilize atmospheric uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases, we have to do 10 times better than that, 70 percent. We're saying we're going to do 100 percent or even better. We're actually maybe even trying to achieve negative emissions, pull emissions out of the atmosphere. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, a large fraction of that will be through source reductions like these compact lamps. Uh, Give uh, us a few other examples because we're actually running out of time. Right. Well, take a refrigerator. It uh, uh, releases its volume in emissions every year. A super efficient model reduces that to a vegetable bin's worth. So you can now find these high efficiency refrigerators on the internet. Uh, take Whirlpool's model, which is the top of the line. It actually has a carbon activated water filter. So if you uh, buy bottled water, you can get your water through this refrigerator and it will pay for the entire cost of the refrigerator in the first. Uh, 30 months of operation. Um, we're going to have a climate, a safeclimate.net website where people can learn about every opportunity. They'll be able to do interactive calculations and see about transportation, tree planting, all the appliances that you use in your home and other actions that you can take to reduce your carbon footprint. That's a great summary. Uh, I want to thank Michael Totten uh, from World Resources Institute and Fred Sassine, Mayor of uh, Mount Rainier, for joining me in the coffee house. Uh, if you'd like some more information about how to get Energy Star products, that is, those that uh, produce, uh, perform at energy um, at more efficient levels than the government requires, uh, contact uh, the website that you see on the screen. Uh, Still to come, household pests, which ones are truly dangerous, an innovative summer dance and self-awareness program for teens, African music by Anun Sagroma, meet Lisa Foster, professional boxer, a guide to summer films, videos, and TV, and the Tacoma Park Independence Day Parade. But first... Lots of floats and black beans, my recipe and mom's revereware, I bought the same pot where she cooked magic pork chops with fried onions swirling and mashed potatoes by hand, the metal masher thumping and clanking against the bottom. Even string beans tasted good, snapped in uneven pieces, draining the water in one swift motion, the lid a strainer, and one solid cube of butter losing shape on top.
Whether your home is a story high or a high rise, old or a year old, tidy or untidy, you are probably sharing it with many kinds of creatures. Some are too small or nocturnal to grab your attention. Others may have irritated you or even pushed you into extermination mode. But is capital punishment really warranted? Here to help us distinguish simply annoying home pests from those that potentially carry real danger is Steve Jubik, horticultural consultant with the Maryland Cooperative Extension Service of Montgomery County. Welcome to the Coffee House. Thank you. There are many, many kinds of pests, from raccoons, the big ones, to house dust mites, which you can't even see. Yeah. Um, what are the most common ones in this area? Well, some of the most common questions we get at the Cooperative Extension Office are about termites, ants, particularly carpenter ants. Uh, they stand out way above the others, but we get a wide variety of questions. Um, which are the most dangerous for us? I guess those are of most concern that can actually damage our health. Of course, it'll be rare. It's not every mouse you see that's going to be potentially life-threatening, but um, give me well, some examples. Well, we get some questions uh, on spiders sometimes about black widows, brown recluse. Fortunately, they're not that common around here, particularly the brown recluse. But we get a lot of questions primarily about ticks, oh, yes. including um, deer ticks um, and Lyme disease. Now, a deer mouse, would that carry a deer tick as well as uh, oh, viruses? It, it very often it could. Um, the way the life cycle of a, a deer tick works is uh, after the egg hatches, it um, attaches itself to its, its first host, mm -hmm. and it's usually uh, a mouse. Right. And from feeding from the mouse, it moves on to its next stage to a, to a larger host, right, and eventually people. getting up to deer or to people. Okay. And it's when it feeds on that mouse is where it picks up the actual uh, Lyme disease. And there's also a virus, virus that um, deer, ticks, uh, deer mice carry. Is that not a threat in this area? Uh, I, I don't have a real handle on that, yeah. uh, but um, Lyme disease is certainly yes. increasing mm -hmm. uh, each year. And also the, the amount of deer that we have right. and the amount of deer ticks is most likely increasing too. Now rats as well are, are very uh, oh, yeah. disease prone. And uh, apparently 49,000 people in the U.S. get bitten by rats every year. It's no laughing matter. Could you say some of the Well, that's, for, for a lot of people, they, they may not realize they have a rat infestation. And it um, kind of goes unnoticed. And there are certain things to look for, and you could probably contact our office or maybe uh, the county health department to get some advice on that. And in fact, it's probably, if you own a business or if you have a rat problem, they may even come out and visit with you. Yeah. But, um, it, it, it is a real serious problem. And it's not just the bites, it's their droppings, oh, absolutely. Um, their shed skin, there's, yep. there's a lot that um, carry. Also have fleas and, and right. things like that. Um, now if your cat has fleas, is that potentially dangerous to you? Some people have allergies to cat fleas. Um, could there be something else in the fleas? Uh, it could be. I think you mentioned earlier there's sometimes uh, people have allergies maybe to, to dust mites right. or to, uh, to hair. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to recognize maybe where you're picking up the allergy from. Mm -hmm. But it's often it may be brought in with the cat, so there might be a combination of things that uh, okay. there. Um, talking of allergies, yellow jackets uh, can sting people and, and give them very serious, even deadly, um, allergic reactions. Are there um, other kinds of things that yellow jackets can oh. do to you? Nasty well, stink. <laughs> oh, well, the yellow jackets, what they usually do is as the season progresses, they become increasingly more aggressive. They become a little bit more uh, schizophrenic or senile as the time goes on. They're, they will become more aggressive, not only uh, more likely to sting you, but they also they will bite you. Mm -hmm. And they do not have a barb stinger like honeybees, so they can sting you several times. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah. um, and, and their habits change, too. Okay, um, we haven't talked yet about the big ones, the raccoons, okay. squirrels, um, their rabies carriers potentially. And uh, where would they lurk in your house? They don't come in the front door. Where would well, you find them? Or things like raccoons, uh, generally w people won't have them coming into the house, maybe underneath a porch or something like that. Mm -hmm. How they'll come across them is maybe if they have a, a let's say, a garbage can that's unsecured, right. or they'll come out and, and startle an animal, or they might want to, you know, find the animal and they've got it cornered and, and, they'll, and they'll possibly bite them. Right. It could be a real serious health hazard, yes. Right, and then the chimneys, they can come there and carry their fleas as well. Absolutely, sometimes yeah. what happens, an animal will investigate a chimney, mm -hmm. maybe fall down there and can't get out of that. Mm -hmm. And as a result of being caught in there or maybe establishing a nest, 
uh, fleas, mm -hmm. mites, or other things may uh, come, you know, come as a result. Um, flies, everyone knows, yeah. potentially carry disease into your food. I guess the same is true for uh, roaches. Um, yes. Plus other illnesses. It's not just food poisoning. They can carry uh, nasty diseases, toxic plasmosis, mm -hmm. uh, which can harm unborn children. Um, what about, um, I'd like to run through a few pests that perhaps aren't dangerous to our health, but they damage our possessions. Yes. Um, some of them, um, well, name a few. Oh, well, there's a lot of questions we get about are about um, Indian meal moths. Uh, pantry pests. Pantry pests. Yeah. We get a lot of questions. Well, cigarette beetles, drugstore beetles. How about carpenter beetles? What would they do? Um, we, we, we get questions about um, carpenter ants, and we also uh -huh. get some, some beetles, some wood-boring beetles, like the old house boar. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also uh, beetles, um, powder post beetles. And powder post beetles and, and old house boar will, will damage wood. Mm -hmm. Drugstore uh, beetles? Well, drugstore beetles, and, and it's a real close counterpart, the cigarette beetle, mm -hmm. they're very omnivorous. They'll eat a wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. As long as it's basically organic matter and base, they'll eat it. So we'll, you'll find them in places where you normally wouldn't think of pests being in spices, oh medicines, goodness. tobacco. Yes. Sawtooth grain beetle, I guess it goes after grain. Yes, and, there, and, and there's some similar beetles to that. Sawtooth grain beetle, and there's a red flower beetle and so forth. And they're more common than people realize, particularly if they store large amounts of grain mm -hmm. products, their populations will accumulate over time. And the pantry pest will get into grains and uh, yes. sweet products. Yeah. Sometimes they're, we, they're a moth, aren't they, essentially? Uh, an Indian meal moth, that's how people notice. They'll see a oh. moth in their house flooding around, maybe one, then two. And then, then their concern, is this a fabric pest or is this right, a pantry pest? Another. And sometimes they, 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 when they first see a moth, they'll think it's a, a fabric pest when mm -hmm. actually it's a pantry pest. And um, later on with time, they'll, they'll find the, the larva. Larva in the flower and in, in the, the, the flower and, picnics yeah, and <laughs> things like that, yeah. Um, some which people maybe think are harmful but aren't, I guess, are uh, silverfish. Silverfish are fairly benign, but sometimes yeah. people have a you know, different people have different thresholds what's acceptable to them, how many yeah. bugs will they have in their house. <laughs> some people will tolerate them and some won't. But they're basically they'll eat uh, like wood uh, uh, binding, I mean, mm -hmm. paper, uh, the binding of books, things like that. Okay. Millipedes, they look ghastly, but are yes. they harmful? Some, no, not really, not yeah. at all. But what happens is they sometimes occur in such large numbers, yeah. and maybe from year to year you, you may not have. Uh, seen them in, in those numbers, and they, they kind of bother people. Like, yeah. why, why am I having these now? Crunching under fire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cave crickets, they look so horrendous. Oh, gosh, yeah. But they're, they're harmless. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're very frightening. They're, they're, they're more likely uh, to find those in places where there's a little bit of high humidity, usually in your basement, dark places like okay. that. And your first time seeing them, they're kind of frightening looking. Yeah. I'd love to just very quickly talk about the box elder bug, which you say is in gardens now, but it's going to pot potentially invade? Yes. Uh, this spring we've had a real problem with box elder bugs, I, probably because of the mild winters. And um, their populations, I expect, to be, will be real high again this fall. And they'll come into your house uh, during the uh, early fall, early winter period, trying to make, you know, keep warm. And they'll be wandering around. And they really don't pose any threat to oh, you. Good, good. Well, a big thank you to you, Steve Jubik of Maryland Cooperative Extension Service for throwing light on the dark recesses of our homes. I'm Kathy Christensen, and this has been In Sickness and in Health. Coming up, a unique program for teen dancers, pro boxing, female style, suggestions for summer film, video, and TV viewing, and this.
Hi, and welcome to Dance Talk Tacoma. This edition will visit with people from my home turf, the Dance Exchange. We're going to take a look at a new program called the Teen Initiative, which is as much geared to helping young people learn about themselves and develop life skills as it is about cultivating their budding talents as artists and dancers. Quite honestly, I've been on the road so much this year that I'm here to learn about Teen Initiative too. So with me in the studio to fill us in are its founder, Giselle Mason, and her main teen guide, Vincenza Davis. Welcome, both of you, to the coffee house. Thank you. Thanks. Giselle, I'm wondering if you could start just by telling us what is the Teen Initiative? The Teen Initiative is a program for teens ages 13 to 17 who are invited to the dance exchange to discover their own personal philosophies and find out what it is that's important to them through the art making process. They dance along with this. Yeah, you know? actually that's, um, we encourage not only just dance but also journal, writing, um, collage making, they do a little bit of everything because we really want people, we want the young people to explore all areas of art because everybody has different strengths, not just dance. How come you wanted to do something like this now? I mean, you're an incredible choreographer, a beautiful dancer. Why would you want to take some time in your own life to do this and what, is there something now that made this so pertinent to you? Well, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people in the country are asking themselves about what are young people thinking? What's important to them with all of the, the news that we've heard about the teens? Actually, for me, it wasn't just that information. It wasn't mm -hmm. about just what was happening today for the young people. I've taught um, in Minnesota for two years, mm -hmm. and it was during that time that I learned a lot about myself and a lot about my art through working with these young people mm -hmm. and finding out what was really important to them. And knowing that given the time that they will talk and they will share their voices with you and they will open up and tell us things about ourselves and about themselves that we haven't had an opportunity to hear up until now. Hmm. Vincenza, I know you've just graduated from high school. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> and I know you. you've been a really important part of this all year. Maybe you mm -hmm. could talk a little bit about um, what, why is this an important thing for young people to be doing? Um, well, I think it's important. Um, I think anything that it gives them an opportunity to learn with people who are their peers um, but who are also different from them and come from diverse backgrounds to be able to learn in that setting um, and at the same time to be given a forum to learn about what they think, their opinions, their ideas, what other people think and to be able to have a forum where they can express that and they have a place in the community where they can go and learn about this and then express it to the community. Um, I think it's really valuable and I think it's important for young people to have that place where they can learn all these different things. And I think it's, it's much too often that young people don't have a form in the community where their voices are heard. Um, and I think it's an amazing learning experience. Sounds um, like that's an important part of this, is something about discovering their voice and then having some way to express it. Because I know, Giselle, you mentioned something about art making skills. So it's co obviously a combination of technique building. And then mm -hmm. I, I know, um, I, I mean, I think you're a great teacher, Giselle. But I, I know you've also got a lot of other people helping you. Can you talk a little bit about some of the guests? Um, yeah, in addition to the faculty, myself and Vincenza, we also had Elizabeth Johnson, who was an intern at the Dance Exchange, who worked with us on the Teen Initiative um, project. We also had Sylvia Suma, mm -hmm. who a um, member of Koyaba Koyo Dance she was, Theater. She was on the show. Mm -hmm, yeah. Who um, taught some African dance. We've had Tony Blackman, who is a hip hop artist, who came and worked with the young people. G let me stop you right there, because mm -hmm. I know we've got some tape of that. Maybe we could take a look at, at Tony, and you could tell us a little bit about what we're seeing okay. when we look at it, OK? So um, and just feel free, Giselle, to catch us up on what we're watching. Actually, this is a nice look at the, uh, the Teen Initiative program that's happening this summer. The program is five weeks long this summer. It has been happening all year, but this is a new group that auditioned for the program and started in June. That's Tony Blackman talking mm -hmm. about getting open. This was an <laughs> exercise about getting open, about coming into the circle and opening up. And this young dancer right here is getting open through movement. One of the things we've been talking about is not only how to, for example, in getting open, 
how some of these things are life skills, not only just performing and just dancing and just getting out there, but what does that mean to the rest of your life? <laughs> And a lot of what you see, too, is us exploring some of what's important to us, showing some of the things that we're already, that we're talented in, like she's a cheerleader. Um, everybody has really diverse backgrounds and different personalities and different styles and different ways of communicating. And you'll notice, like, in small groups, we work in small groups, and then some of these people work with each other and, you know, come up with a come up with a small product which we work on and develop which will be ultimately um, shown on July 23rd at the Dance Exchange Studios in a final showing. Mm. What they were working on here was some proverbs. Tony gave them some proverbs and encouraged them to tell the proverbs through movement. <laughs> a little heart there. So it seems like watching the movement that a lot of this must be coming just from their own personal vocabularies. And then I imagine you build, tech, you build on that with other technical forms. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really one of the, the challenges of the Teen Initiative program and creating anything where you're really starting from someone's voice. A lot of the young people and a lot of the um, community people that the Dance Exchange works with sometimes find that oh, I'm supposed to have my own voice. How is that supposed to be valuable? How am I supposed <laughs> to create a product or a process or a performance based on what it is that you know, I believe in what I do? And what we're doing in the Teen Initiative and what the Dance Exchange does within the community is works with the community's voice and the community's gesture and the community's movement and the community's themes and really brings that into light so that when we're watching and when we see performances, um, we're really getting a taste of what's important to the community. And then as artists, we're responsible for shaping that in a way that really gives the community a sense of what it means to create art in the community, a sense of pride in what they're doing, and a level of expertise when it's presented. Great. Vincenza, maybe quickly before we have to leave, mm -hmm. how can people get involved? What's the future of the Teen Initiative? What's coming up? Um, well, after uh, our showing in, on July 23rd, this fall we're going to have two classes at the Dance Exchange. Um, one of them is going to be for uh, young people with an interest in dance composition oh, great. and choreography. And the other one is going to be open to anybody who's interested in movement, dance. You don't have to have any experience. Um, other than that, for youth who are involved in organizations, um, we're going to be doing four residencies this fall with local organizations who have youth groups. And we're going to send Dance Exchange representatives out then to do work with them. Oh, that's nice. So the teens can go out, they'll be performing, they'll be working in the community with mm -hmm. other teen groups as well as developing their skills as artists. It sounds yeah. terrific, you guys, and yeah. uh, best of luck. Thanks. We'll Thank be you. performing at the Tacoma Park Street Festival and the Tacoma Park um, Folk Festival coming up, as well as our final performance on July 23rd, Friday at the Dance Exchange Studios. That's great. And I know, of course, I know a little bit about the Dance Exchange, that they'll be joined by many people as they continue to grow, older and younger alike. Again, yep. thanks both of you for coming. I'm being signaled that our time is up. Thank you, Giselle Mason and Vincenza Davis of the Teen Initiative for joining me in the coffee house. I'm looking forward to seeing the fruits of your labors in the future performances. And you at home, if you'd like more information about the Teen Initiative program, you can phone Vincenza Davis at the Dance Exchange. I'm Liz Lerman, and this has been Dance Talk Tacoma. watch this summer if you can just get beyond the Phantom Menace. Like Buena Vista Social Club. This is the latest from the team of German filmmaker Wim Wenders and the American musician Rye Cooter.
Vim Fenders is one of those European auteurs who has a love affair with Hollywood. The End of Violence was his latest release. Ry Cooter has cut some great CDs and made some amazing soundtracks, like For Last Man Standing and Primary Colors. He's famous for delving deep into American folk music and making it cool again. So just imagine taking these two guys to Cuba and introducing them to some of the grand old greats of Cuban jazz. That is Buena Vista Social Club. It's a documentary. It's an event. It's amazing. If you don't love it, don't tell me about it. Long forgotten, yet legendary Cuban musicians were still alive and well. <laughs> There are films I haven't seen, but I want to, like Spike Lee's new movie, Summer of Sam, mostly white ensemble cast set in New York, summer 1977, when everybody was afraid of a serial killer who called himself Son of Sam. It's gotten mixed reviews, but I just want to see the latest from one of America's serious filmmakers. And if you don't want to buy a ticket, there's still plenty to see. Go down to the best theater in D.C., and it's totally free at the National Gallery of Art. Everything from classics of Brazilian cinema to the latest in Canadian documentary, like Nettie Wilde's film, A Place Called Chiapas. In it, she gets an interview with Zapatista guerrilla leader Subcomandante Marcos. Or you could rent a video. You know all those films you meant to see that are finally in video stores, like Life is Beautiful or Little Voice. I thought Little Voice was very touching. It's about what happens when a showbiz producer and a dreamy young telephone repairman both discover truly hidden talent. She's a girl who can sing anything and mimic any singer, but only in her bedroom, where she hides from her shrieky mom and listens to her defunct dad's old LPs. It's got a lot of bad language, but oddly moving. What did I say? What did I say? Hey, look at the bed on him now, look at the old player. Yeah. Records, all the all hey, you! Trust the Calypso! Come shine. High as a mountain, deep as a river, come rain. Oh, come shine. And how about that tried and true fallback television? Public Television is airing the long-awaited history documentary, After Stonewall. It follows the history of gay and lesbian rights from 1969. And the public TV series, POV, is airing interesting offbeat independent films all summer long. One of the most compelling of them for me is called School Prayer. It's about a town in Mississippi where for decades the students have worshipped as part of their school day. And everyone, everyone thinks that's the right thing to do until a new family moves into town and the mom protests. That's when two different versions of America come face to face and go to court. The concept of a prayer being said over the intercom for every child to hear, what about the Jewish children or the Catholic children or some other belief or somebody who doesn't believe in God at all? Why are they having to listen to this over the intercom? <laughs> There have been some schools that have created situations where values and the mention of religion are treated as hostile items, and it seems to me that's doing a disservice to the education of young people. Religion is important to all cultures as a common denominator, and to act as if this school is a religion-free zone is doing a disservice to the future of these young people. What's so unusual about this film is that both sides of the battle are shown with care and even empathy. So many movies, so many interesting ways to make movies, and so little time. Well, good luck, good viewing. Hi, and welcome to Body and Soul. 
We live in a time when it's pretty easy to say, been there, done that. But how many of you have tried to make a name for yourself or make your own piece of history by putting up your dukes against hard-punching women boxers? It's not for the faint-hearted. As Tacoma Park's Lisa Foster, Foster, also known as Too Fierce Foster, who has snatched a little national glory in the boxing ring. Or as Ed Bager, our roving correspondent who, uh, well, Actually, why don't you see for yourself? One look at Lisa Foster of Tacoma Park, and you might think she's either a model, perhaps a dancer, or even a fitness trainer. I'm a boxer. I don't brawl. Most of, most of the female fighters that you see are brawlers. They stand in there toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and it's boom, 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 nonstop training punch for punch. I don't believe in that, you know. I mean, I can do that, mm -hmm. you know, I can, and I, I've been trained to do that, but I don't do it. I, I box. I'm a boxer. Actually, Lisa, too fierce Foster, is a woman's junior bantamweight professional boxer, currently ranked number six in the world. Foster currently works as a trainer and has danced as well as modeled but boxing is her full-time career. In addition, Lisa is a mother of two and a devoted wife of 10 years. Aside from the obvious risk of injury, Lisa's husband has no reservations about her career choice. Seeing how well she is in the ring, um, how everybody else perceives her to be the next champion, so I'm not too concerned about injuries. Foster committed to boxing full time when her toughness and aggressiveness was penalized in martial arts competition. You're not supposed to hurt your opponent, mm -hmm. you know. So it was like, gosh, I'm afraid to throw this punch or throw this kick because I'm going to hurt him, you know, and I can't control it, you know. So I, near like my last two fights in karate, I almost got disqualified. So I knew right then. I think I'm finished with this. <laughs> but just how tough is a lady boxer? One of Lisa's trainers assured me, Lisa, pound for pound, is just as tough as any male boxer. Well, you know, she's been sparring with a lot of guys that are about 130, 135 pounds, and it's, she's been punishing a lot of male fighters. I think she's ready. She's the best woman boxer I've ever seen. I mean, I seen, I watch boxing every single day. Any fights on TV or live, I see it. I didn't see any woman yet with her skill and her power. I think she's going to surprise a lot of people. Still, I had to find out firsthand if this was true. So Lisa was That's kind cool. enough to give me a demonstration. I want to remind our viewers, to don't, don't try this at home. I'm a professional moron, OK? so. Don't do as I do. Oh, <laughs> Cut. Growing up, my mother told me never to hit a girl. Now I know why. Their jab can be devastating. While there's no doubt in my mind that Lisa is a legitimate boxer, ironically, her toughest fight may not lie in the ring but rather outside the ropes in terms of gaining positive publicity and exposure for her sport. While no longer considered a sideshow, women's boxing still has a long way to go in terms of money and respect. Out of 11 scheduled bouts this year, Lisa has only fought in four, winning them all while the rest were postponed due to forfeit or cancellation. Naturally, Lisa won't throw in the towel. Like her idol, Muhammad Ali, she's not going to give up without a fight. Women, I want this sport. I mean, just like anything, if you want, I want to be the best at what I'm doing. I want everybody to know that, you know. And like Ali, Foster possesses the same charisma, style, and most importantly, the power to draw an audience and fan base. Even when her career is over, Lisa will continue to promote, teach, and train future fighters. And if there's still any doubt whether she and women's boxing will succeed, Foster will offer her opinion as quick and as strong as her jab. 
Yeah. Like, if you work hard at something, it's going to work out. Period. For the Coffee House, I'm Ed Bajer. Thank you, Ed. A nervy performance. <laughs> okay, here in the studio with me is Lisa Foster. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Um, so I'm, uh, I have to tell you, I'm a lot older <laughs> and wiser than Ed, and <laughs> so I'm not going to be putting up my dukes <laughs> here. Uh, but uh, does that happen a lot? Do guys want to get in the ring with you? Uh, at first. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Until they until you yeah. land a couple of uh, one actually, twos? Actually, you know what? Because of my size, they underestimate me. And so they're like, oh, yeah, I can, we can do this. And, can. Then, and then, you know, once we uh, get into it a little bit, they're like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. I didn't know it was going to be like that. So, yeah, but I enjoy yeah. it. You they do, do too. It. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, you, you spar with, uh, with men, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that because Mainly there aren't guys. enough women um, partners or...? Yeah, actually, that's that's what it is. There, there aren't very m many women that work out in my gym. I can spar with no. So you do it. You you, so, yeah, you beat up on the guys and then <laughs> <laughs> take it. <laughs> oh, take it believe into. me, I have taken some lessons though. Uh, okay. <laughs> I've learned a lot, but yeah, I, I get a lot of uh, work from them. Now you grew up around here, right? You grew up in D.C. Yes. And uh, have lived here all your life. Mm -hmm. um, what? You had four brothers. Is that was that the yeah. excuse you, you started <laughs> for getting into this? <laughs> yeah, I have, I have four brothers, and uh, one of my brothers was like a boxing fanatic, and we, you know, whenever Muhammad Ali would come on television, he's like, "Forget it, I'm watching, I'm watching Ali tonight. <laughs> you guys are just gonna have to suffer." And I'm like, so I just adapted to it. I, I you know, I was like, "All right, we will watch Ali, and then watch something else," you know. <laughs> but yeah. Um, we were pretty much all into contact sports. I played football with them, oh. basketball, mm -hmm. jumped ramps with my bicycle, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So. And, then, and then you did martial arts. And how long yeah. have you been doing boxing now? <clears throat> I've been doing boxing for two years. Serious, I've actually serious. only had two amateur fights. And you get two amateur fights and then professional. And then, then, then you went pro. Yes. And mm -hmm. you get paid. You get actual money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I get paid. How, can I ask you how much? Um, or in for... The, no problem. Yeah. For women boxers, uh, starting out in four rounders, we usually get paid anywhere between 150 to 300 a round. And it's always a set contract. So you're going to get it whether you knock the person out in the first round or not. You're going to get the full amount. Right. Right. Well, I, and I noticed, of course, all the publicity this, uh, this month is about uh, the women's soccer team yeah. and uh, that they're going to maybe make. Seventy-five hundred or ten thousand dollars a piece for their uh, heroic efforts. <laughs> and it, you know, none of this is very big money, of course. But uh, presumably, at some stage, the endorsements and and so forth mm -hmm. would would actually lead to real money. Is there a way for for you uh, to get your picture on the cover of Newsweek as some of the the uh, women's soccer? Oh yes, yes, certainly, it's yes, most definitely. <laughs> All I have to do. I look at it like this, and I'm very positive. Um, I'm just like, if I keep, you know, keep myself in the game, stay trained, stay focused, and just, you know, just like the soccer players, they're awesome. It's about time, right? Basketball <laughs> players, the girls who are playing basketball. All I have to do is stay focused, and I can just do. I can do exactly what they're doing. You know, and we'll all get somewhere. Is this is this too brutal a sport though for it, for popular audiences? No. 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 no not at all. Not at all. It's, it's a, beautiful. It's, a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. It's like dancing. It's like you know anything. It's like uh, football. Well, you know, foot, it's like football, football, right? And the reason why I say that is because football isn't looked at as a brutal sport. Not to me, you know, not to most. It's like a win or well, lose these situation. days you should say soccer, though, because soccer is what's paying off. Well, soccer. soccer okay. right? All <laughs> the football, football guys make a lot of money. Well, yeah. I mean, well here's, here's my, my point, though. And I think um, one reason the, the soccer women have had great success is they don't look masculine. And I, I'm mm -hmm. saying this as a real guy, of course, right, as a real right. male point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so you can slug me. Uh, <laughs> If you want, but but uh, maybe maybe that's what boxing needs needs a a um, someone who does someone like you who doesn't look doesn't look masculine looks beautiful. 
Thank Looks you. Looks like a woman. Thank you very <laughs> much. I try to keep the femininity and be a good role model toward young little girls. You know, I don't have to walk around looking like a man or brute stacked and yeah. all that to be a boxer. And I think that we can all be glamorous in our sport, no matter what we do, if we wrestle, play soccer. I think that it's all beauty within there, you know. So you're still a woman. You just have to project right. yourself as a right. woman. Right. No, I think Keep your uniqueness in there. <laughs> <laughs> what do your kids think about it? They like it. Do I they? mean, you know, it, it's like, my daughter, one minute she wants to be a boxer, next minute she wants to play basketball. She's just five now. Next minute she wants to um, be a firefighter. But I'm just happy that she's, you know, oh, it's oh, very fair, selective. Fair she just, yeah. When you're a girl, five-year-old girl. <laughs> and it's true, you know, the world is open to you yes. much more than it ever was to five-year-old girls 30 years ago. Um, you have a shot to be a champion. Thank you. Your husband believes in you, right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> he right. Said, he and says a lot you're going to do it. A lot of people too. Yeah. You're going to uh, you're going to keep doing this. Yes, I am. So we could have you back on this show uh, with a belt around your. Uh, Most definitely, man. Most I will have one here, here. I have uh, three. Three of them. That's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, you told me that you already were a champion. All you need is a belt. That's, that's right. That's uh, right. I'm uh, already a you're champion. You're champion. I agree with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you for having, uh, for being here. Um, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, I'm Howard Cohn. This has um, been Body and Soul.